you are going to want to listen to this episode if you're looking to improve in your sales role so that you can improve in your overall career. Today we're talking to a man who was promoted from sales development rep to account executive after only nine months. He has worked at great companies like Podium and Lucid Software. He's been awarded rep of the month and rep of the quarter many times over and is a current President's Club qualifier. So without further ado, let's roll. Welcome to the Sales Leader Show. Today we're here with Stephen Harper. He's a commercial account executive with Lucid Software. And last we spoke, Steve, you said that one of the things that you see a lot of reps do that they should stop doing is nurturing limiting beliefs. So I'm curious... Like, what exactly do you mean by limiting beliefs? It's <laughs> people have this vibe that salespeople are just kind of cocky and arrogant, but in, in reality, we're, we're very emotional people. Um, you know, the, our, our quota is, and I don't think it should be this way, but our, our quota, our number is almost, we can't, we can't separate that from who we are as a seller. And so um, I feel like, uh, it, it, it takes, it takes a bit of fine tuning to be able to figure out, um, Hey, I just, I can, I need to let this one go. I need to shrug this one off kind of like, okay, let me take a breather. Um, so I, I, I think that that's why it is, um, you know, we are, we're emotional beings and, uh, we need to learn how to, uh, to shrug it off and just be consistent. You know, um, I think that's, that's, a one of the reasons why it is the way it is, but yeah, it is true, man. I've noticed that, that we're not superheroes, right? (laughs) And sometimes when we're in sales, I get a little bit of that imposter syndrome because I'm like, I'm not as bulletproof as I think that that guy is who I see as being really successful in sales. Do you think that that kind of contributes maybe like comparing to other people or, um, comparing ourselves against where we think we should be? Yeah. So like, there's a lot of comparisons that can happen, right? Like you can compare yourself to the top performers. You can compare yourself to your expectations. You can compare yourself to, it, it's so funny. Cause I feel like when we are comparing and comparison is not what we need to be doing. We need to be focused on, uh, we need to focus on, be focused on learnings. Right. Um, but the comparison comes in, it's, it's really hard, especially when you're a competitive person. And I feel like a lot of salespeople are extremely competitive. So the comparisons are naturally just going to show up and you're comparing yourself to anything and everything around you. Um, The, the, like, so my biggest fault is, you know, yeah, I compare myself to the people like the, the other leaders on the team. So when it comes down to it, like, even if I'm like one of the top five reps in the org, which you know, I've been recently, uh, I'll look at the people that are, you know, the one, two, three, and four, and I'll be like, oh man, I'll never be that. I'll never be there. Um, but then I'll also compare myself. And I do this often is set unreal expectations, um, or maybe like my future expectations. I expect everything to come right now. And I'll compare myself against expectations that, these are expectations that are maybe they're not realistic today. Maybe they're realistic six months from now, a year from now, but I'll, I'll start comparing. And and I think that comparison game is really what, what can kill a sales rep. Um, Yeah. I mean, yeah, you've got to be able to measure. You've got to, you've got to set goals and be able to achieve goals. Um, But you you can't emotionally, you can't emotionally tie to those goals um, because your, your, your mindset is going to suffer for if you have a bad day, bad week, bad month, bad quarter. Um, just know that you're not the failures you have. Uh, you are what you learn from those failures. I mean, how do you keep that perspective? I mean, how, how have you overcome that in your career? Uh, 
those limiting beliefs and that comparison that maybe holds you back and makes you feel like you're not enough? Like how, how have you um, been able to overcome it or is it a hundred percent overcomable or is it something we'll always battle? What do you think? I mean, I think it's overcomable. Um, uh, I don't know if that's a word, but I'm going to use that right along with you. Um, I think you can overcome it for sure. Um, you know, I, I struggled, th- I struggled with that all throughout my twenties, just kind of this imposter syndrome kind of mindset there. Um, you know, I wanted to achieve greatness, but I, it, it, like, it almost felt like this scarcity mindset that I had was limiting my, my ability to achieve any kind of strong results. And what people don't realize is that greatness isn't achieved overnight. And what happens typically is that greatness comes and is going to come, but you've got to allow yourself to fail a lot before greatness comes. And I feel like I'm still a long way from greatness, but I know for a fact I'm on that path, um, and which is exciting for me. It's exciting to know that, hey, the direction I'm going is an extremely positive direction. And, you know, I've already achieved some pretty good things in my career, but I'm not at the place where I'd want to be. But I'm, I'm at this point where I'm actually able to separate myself from the achievements. Um, so I can say, because the fact of the matter is, if I'm, if I'm looking at myself and saying, hey, this is who I am, and these are the achievements I think I should be achieving, I'm never going to measure up because the achievements, that's, that's a moving target. Um, so honestly, I think, I think the more you fail and the more you pick yourself up from failure, that's going to allow you to get over it. Um, you know, I've just, I'm just at a point in my career where I failed enough and um, I've had enough good leadership and a good, good, like colleagues around me um, where I've kind of developed that mindset. Um, but it might be harder for someone that hasn't seen as much or is afraid of failure. Um, you kind of have to work through it, but allow yourself to fail and be willing to pick yourself up from that. Cause like, I'm sorry, I'm kind of rambling here, but the big thought there is, um, Basically, set your goal, set your sights on that, and and don't stop yourself from getting there. Um, just keep going, um, one step at a time, kind of a thing. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that did. Absolutely, yeah. We're gonna dig, I think, a little bit more into that in a second, but I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here. So when we were speaking before about you coming on the show, you said that you think reps should focus more of their effort on what they can control, meaning like their activity. So I'm curious, can you give me an example of what have you noticed reps doing instead of that? Like, what are they doing if they're not focusing on their, their controllables or their activity? Yeah. Um, oftentimes for better or worse, reps will, uh, look at how much they've closed and they'll, they'll say that that's, that proves that they're a good or a bad seller. Um, they're good or bad at their job based on the revenue they brought in. And, and to be super honest, that is the indicator. I mean, that's the indicator. That's what the, that's what the companies go off of. Um, but we all know, we've all been through a deal where everything looked good. You did everything right. You said everything right. The product was a perfect fit. And then for whatever reason, like crap hit the fan at your customer and they couldn't pull the trigger for whatever reason. And and we've all had deals like that that just crumbled beneath our feet. And is that, yeah, you could probably think of things you could have done maybe slightly differently, but ultimately it wouldn't have changed the outcome. Is that really a reflection of who you are as a salesperson? Um, I, I don't think so. So I kind of like boiling things down. Obviously, revenue is the premier indicator. Um, but if you can't boil it down to a process to, that, that can help you duplicate repeatable results, there's, there's no sense in measuring yourself. It's just basically you're just, you're just wishing and hoping. Um, so kind of my thought there is, and this is what I've seen working with different sales leaders um, and 
kind of what I'm what I'm putting in place in my career or what I've put in place in my career, which is it's like it's like a three step process. You basically look at, OK, how am I closing? Like, am I bringing in revenue? That's the most important indicator. Now I can't always control it, but it is the most important indicator because my paycheck's on the line and the company's paycheck is on the line. Uh, the second thing is, um, am I building pipeline? Am I basically, am I, am I building a base of potential revenue? And that is something I actually have a lot more control over. That's basically, am I doing my prospecting job? Am I figuring out what targets I can go after? And am I setting up a plan for that? So kind of, how's my pipeline doing? Um, am I, am I building prospects? Am I, you know, building a plan for those prospects? How's that doing? And then the third is activity. To me, this is, this is, it is extremely crucial, extremely important, but it's the lowest thing to measure against. And that's, are you making phone calls? Are you emailing? Are you texting? Are you sending LinkedIn, making connections on LinkedIn, sending connect connection requests and message requests? And are, are you doing all of those things, kind of the, the outreach activities? Um, and those are extremely crucial. You'll, you'll never make a sale without the activity metrics. But it's also just what you have to do anyways. And you get a lot of managers and a lot of salespeople um, that all they focus on is the activity. Uh, but in reality, the activity without a direction is there's zero strategy there. So are you closing and are you building pipeline is far more crucial for, for a seller to focus on. But you have the most control over the activity. You have the most control over pipeline and activity. And so to me, the pipeline is predominant because I think if you if you're an elder that's in, I mean, if you're not just like first year of your career, like you're still learning like basics, if you're not there, then I think maybe getting like, if you're over the fear of making a phone call or sending an email, which some people still have that fear. Yeah. Okay. You got to get over that. But if you're over that fear, which I think most sellers are, then the most important thing for you to focus on is your pipeline and your strategy around that pipeline. And the reason I say that is because, look, I'm not afraid to make a phone call. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to make a, a phone call just to make a phone call. And, and you get a lot of people like, I mean, we've all had those managers in our career that's just like, okay, you got to make 100 dials a day. And it's like, they don't give a crap what those dials are or who you're talking to or why you're talking to them or what you're saying to them. Um, that's the lowest level to manage towards. Um, in reality, I'd rather be able to call a CEO or, a, or even a director or a VP and say, I'm calling this person because this person has X influence on the deal. And the direction I'm going requires this person sign off, this person sign off, and this person sign off. And you know, I'm I'm building I'm building the story here. I, I understand why I'm calling that person. Um, so, anyways, that, that that's kind of yeah. You have a lot of control over the activity. You got supreme control over the activity. You've got a ton of control around pipeline. Um, you don't have necessarily full control over revenue um, targets, but if you can focus on that strategic element, which I think strategy is massively important and strategy comes with your pipeline, um, the activity is going to follow suit. And I think, I think your revenue will follow suit as well. You'll be more consistent about revenue generation uh, than if you were to just focus on one of the outliers being the revenue or the activity. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because you simplify it down to the three indicators that you really need to track. And from what it sounds like, what we kind of talked about before is like, you need to track, are you, you know, your, your sales, are you closing deals? And is it the, to the level that you need to be? And then number two is how healthy is your pipeline? And are you building it? You know, are you just, are you just, is it just healthy? Cause you worked hard last month or is it, it are you still building it? And then number three would be activity. And if. Your revenue is good, but your pipeline's not healthy. That means you're going to have a bad month, you know? 
So that means yeah. now we have to really take a close microscopic look at that activity and see what are you doing and and does it need to be more strategic? Does it need to be more volume? What needs to happen to get that pipeline healthy? Um, but the pipeline ultimately, if that's healthy, you've secured your future, right? Absolutely. And, and that's the thing too, like you'll get a lot of people, I mean, just to double click on this a little bit more, you'll get a lot of people that will, they'll do big sprints of things, right? And what what you get is peaks and valleys, like massive peaks, massive valleys, where one month they just blow their number out. And then the next month they're just dry. It's just a desert. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, and, and I, I'm currently, I'm currently at that place where it's like, I'm starting to institute or I've in the last month or two, I've been instituting a little bit more of daily consistency in kind of pipe generation. And that's, that goes like one of my goals almost daily is to close an op. Now I can, I can say I'm going to close lost it or I'm going to close one it. I don't care which one it is. I can control if I'm closing an op every single day, whether I'm winning it or losing it. So that means that I'm going to keep a clean pipeline. And if, if there's just no traction, no movement, I'm going to get rid of it. But in order to get rid of an op, I have to replace it with another op. Dude, that and is so, such a good, sorry to interrupt, man. I, I just, yeah. I actually like that a lot because I'm mostly like, I, I a lot of times I'm focused on adding ops to my pipeline. Right. Yeah. You have to do that, obviously, but closing an op every day. And I love that, that you don't care which way it goes. If it's a, if it's a closed loss or a closed one, because like the point is that you just, you don't want a bunch of ops just in there clogging up your pipeline that you've let yeah. slip through the cracks or that just aren't ever going to go anywhere. Um, and so you want to make sure they're, that they're not doing those two things. You're not letting them slip through the cracks and let a good deal go bad. And you're also not, just letting bad deals clog up your pipeline. So you have no clue what the heck's actually going on. You know, mm. um, man, I like that. That's a really good tip. That's yeah, awesome. It's, it's so important. I mean, we've all been there too, right? You've got a plethora of deals and you've got too much to follow up on. So you end up just following up on a, a handful of deals. And then you get, you know, either some of those are just not real deals and you're not going to work them or some of those deals just die and fizzle out even though there was interest behind them. And so you really have to manage that, like figure out what's the workload I can do on a daily basis and build a pipeline around that. Um, anyways, there's a lot of strategies around pipeline that I think are extremely crucial and, and, and we could probably talk at length on that. But, but I think that that mentality of just, Hey, manage to the things you can control. Um, and you can control when you close an op. I think that's extremely crucial. The mindset of, hey, I'm going for no all the time. And I'm trying to get a no from this person. And if they give me a yes, great, let's advance it. But if they give me a no, great, I'm going to close it out. Because that's a win for me. I don't want to waste my time on someone that's going to ultimately give me a no anyways. Right. Um, so anyway, sorry. Uh, sorry to... Triple click on that one. Triple click. Yeah, there oh, we yeah. go. <laughs> that was good, man. Uh, this question I'm actually excited about because um, because it's part of your story that I, I think is really relatable. So we were talking about when you got promoted from BDR or I don't know if everyone uses those terms, but basically from an appointment setter to a, a closer, an account executive. Uh, you said that you struggled in the beginning that you weren't willing to embrace the suck as you put it, which is awesome. And I'm curious, like what, what do you mean by that? Um, so specifically what I mean by that, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll actually, I'll actually go a little bit into my story here. Um, because to truly understand that, like, uh, I avoided being in sales for a long time. Um, I've always been intrigued by sales. I think sales is one of the most fascinating careers to be in. But when you're when you come down to it, it's 
it's scary if you're not ready to um, to go all in. Um, it's scary because your income is tied to your number. And, and more importantly, it's not even the income. It's more importantly is my pride is tied to how well I do. Yeah. And I mean, I had that, I had that mindset, which is a fully scarcity mindset at the time, which is why I didn't jump into sales. Um, my mindset was, oh, what if I, what if I fail? What if I can't close anything? I'm just going to look like an idiot. No one's going to believe in me. I'm not going to believe in me. But in reality, I just didn't believe in myself. Um, but anyways, don't want to dive too much into that. But I, I fully had that. So I was super interested in sales, knew it's something I wanted to do. I wished I was really good at, but I didn't believe in myself. And so I kind of like touched on all these areas. You know, I went into marketing. I kind of did product, product management, which is, I honestly, I, to go into how I got into that, but it was, it was an interesting role. It just wasn't what I wanted. Um, but it was tangential to marketing, which is why I jumped into it. And then ended up starting a small business that didn't do super well, but did okay. And, uh, and then jumped into client success. And my, my actual reasoning for jumping into a client success role was because first I wanted to get into tech. It was a good tech role. Um, second, um, it was, it was a sales job essentially without the stress of selling. And so when you're, when you're choosing something for that, you know, you're, you're picking the wrong thing. You just, just, so this is why, this is where the mentality and the idea of embracing the stuck comes in uh, because I, I chose the wrong job for me. Um, I picked a, a client success manager role and I was good at it. I didn't love it. I was good at it though. And I, um, we could get into this later, but I, I realized that the organization I was in wasn't going to support client success the way they supported sales. I helped close a big deal and I didn't get paid anything for it. And so I ultimately tried to convince the sales team to bring me on as a seller. And they, they brought me on as a, as a, you know, BDR, SDR, one of the appointment setters which was essentially a step down from the role I was in. Um, so I took basically a, a step down and I jumped into that role and I gave it everything I had. It was scary, but I decided, you know what, we got to, if, if it's something you want in life, you better be willing to suffer for it. And so I went all in and I did extremely well in this role as, as a SDR sales development rep. And I was, uh, you could measure it different ways, but for all intents and purposes, I mean, you could say I was, I was top two, top three, but I mean, it, it, the numbers I look at, I mean, which is revenue generation, I was number one. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of different ways you can cut a pie, but the way I cut it, I was number one in the organization as a, as an SDR. Uh, I, I, only did that for nine months and they promoted me to an to an account executive so a closing position and i was excited about that um and this is what i didn't realize i you know i was good as a client success rep i moved into a sdr spot i was good at that i was number one in the organization i came to an ae spot and i was like of course i'm going to crush it i'm the best and what they don't tell you adequately, what they don't adequately prepare you for, or I wasn't adequately prepared for, is that an AE job and an SDR job are vastly different. They take different skills. Um, and I wasn't emotionally, mentally prepared for that. And so this is kind of another area in which Embrace the Suck comes in. Um, you, you have to be ready to, you have to give yourself room to fail. Uh, you know, you're, you might not close a deal on your first day. You might not close a deal in your first month, first quarter, like, but just give yourself a framework to build towards long-term success and, and trust that that framework is going to, is going to do well for you and just be willing to fail and fail and fail. 
because the more you fail, the closer you are to a really strong win. And so that's, that's kind of one of the reasons I, I, I say embrace the suck is extremely important. Um, because if you don't allow yourself to suck really bad, you're never going to be the best at something. Yeah. I, uh, I heard a quote once that I think applies to what you're saying, which was uh, something to the effect of, and I don't know who said it, but something to the effect of like anything worth doing well is worth doing really, really bad at first. I like you know? that. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, the man, that, that makes so much sense. But it is hard, though. Like, it's hard because you want to get in there, especially coming off of a of a of a role where you were you know, you did really well, basically right from the beginning almost. Mm -hmm. And you, you got a promotion very quickly. I mean, nine months afterward, I think by any standard would be seen as fast to be offered a promotion to, to account executive from BDR. And, and then to get into an account executive role and be like, all right, you know, I'm going up. There's no nowhere else to go but up. And I'm doing incredible and I'm going to keep doing that. And then to maybe taste some defeat, you know, and be like, wait a second, I'm not yeah. winning all the time anymore. What's going on? Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, it, yeah, it can, it can get at you. Uh, I mean, I, for, for a bit there, I, I, I took it um, probably, I probably internalized it a little too much. And I, I thought to myself, Hey, maybe sales wasn't the right role for me. Mm. and um ultimately i i decided to per, like keep going with it and give myself more time and D did you have a manager that like helped you or what what got you through that well it's interesting because um i was i was promoted into a role where the manager was kind of on his way out like he was quitting the company and he knew it and he promoted me into the role and he was he was quitting the company so he didn't care like he wasn't trying super hard got a new manager uh and it was her first time being a manager and she was awesome like I, honestly great manager um but like she was still trying to she was still figuring it all out so as a new rep that was struggling and and here's the thing when i say I'm, i was struggling i was i was still like I, w I wasn't even the middle of the team. I was still I, on the upper half of the team, but I just wasn't doing, I wasn't per performing the way I expected to perform. Um, so I wasn't the bottom of the team at all, which is, which is funny. Like we set our own, like, this is what we expect. And I expected to be number one. And if I wasn't number one, I was failing. Um, so I was failing hard every month. That's what it, what it looked like to me, but. Um, great manager there, but she was new. Um, and then I, I actually moved companies. So I went to a new company and um, was learning that job about six months into that job. I felt, I still felt like, okay, maybe like I was doing okay, but I, I felt like, okay, maybe sales was wrong for me. You know, I'd been, I'd been in a closing role for a bit now and maybe sales was wrong for me. And then I had a, a manager um, that I started working with that, um, that totally just, I don't know, best manager I've had, um, in, in my career so far. And he really helped me, uh, basically simplify how I viewed my job, my day-to-day -day job, uh, helped me learn how to do my job more effectively. And it was just basically more mindset stuff, um, helped me understand what I should be focusing on. Cause there's a million and a half things to focus on. But if you can't simplify that for yourself, you're, you're going to struggle. Um, so he, he helped me simplify it a little bit more. And so helped me get a little bit more organized in my mindset and my processes. And, and at that point I started really doing well. Like I started succeeding really well time and time again, consistently top of the team. Um, and and so that is what changed my mindset altogether is just, okay, it's, it's about, you got to, you know, yeah, it sucks. And you got to learn these skill sets, but just establish that framework and trust the process mm -hmm. and, 
yeah, you're going to suck for a while, but allow yourself to suck, allow yourself to fail, be very open about your failures, talk to your team, talk to your leaders, say, hey, this is what happened. This is why that deal didn't go the way I wanted it to. This is what I need to do different next time. And then get their opinion, their feedback. Um, just trust the process. Mm -hmm. Just wrapping up here, I'm curious what, well, do you think that sales reps in general do a good job of planning out their career so that they're actually on some type of trajectory that they want to do? I, I think it depends on the sales rep. Um, I think that there's, I'd say a majority of sales reps don't. don't. Um, so so because, how would you, I mean, kind of, I think everything you talked about really, you know, is important for progressing through a sales career, right? Mm -hmm. But if you could like give any advice, because honestly, um, what kind of, what, what really initiated this podcast was partially inspiration from you that I saw that you had direction in your career and you didn't necessarily like know all the steps to take or where, maybe, you know, where you would end up, but you had a direction where you're like, Hey, I want to be in sales. And then from there you're like, all right, I want to be an AE. And then, you know, and now you want to be enterprises where you're heading you, you know, towards, you yeah. know, so you kind of set these milestones along the way, maybe not from the very beginning, but you had a direction and guess what, when you have a direction and you know what you're looking for, when you find it, you'll take it right. Yeah. Instead of not knowing. Right. So I'm curious, like if you could wrap it up and kind of give some advice since you've been through this process and you've done, I would say extremely well, as far as advancing through your sales career, once you decided to do it, because you've only been doing sales for what? Well, I've only committed to sales like B two B. Yeah, I'm not. Sales I'm not counting the, the phone farm stuff. Yeah, because I've yeah, and and I'm I'm also not even counting. Um, I'm not even counting the the small business that I started, which was essentially a sales role. Yeah. Um, I mean, it counts in the sense that it helps your skills and everything. But like when you actually sure. commit to sales, like. Since you did that, because you weren't in sales when you decided to commit to sales. I've fully committed this. So it's been about four years, probably, yeah. since I've committed to sales. Okay. Um, and yeah. now you're, you're a commercial account executive at an incredible yeah. company, Lucid Software. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a great trajectory. So t I don't know. I, I would love to hear kind of your, if you could summarize what you, some tips. Like you can't say everything, but like if you could summarize your tips and some some ideas on maybe if someone doesn't want to just float through their career forever, they want to actually go somewhere and do something. Uh, what, what would you suggest? Um, I think everything comes down to frameworks. Um, so the, 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 and you're, I'm ADD. So I have a hard time focusing on things if it's not simplified. Um, and so the, the, the simpler I can make it, the easier it's going to be for me to focus on it. And so the reason I say that, so I, I think it's really important for you to know what you want, kind of who you are as a person. Um, some people want to get into management and some people want to be an individual contributor the rest of their career. Know which one you are. Don't chase management just because it's a sexy title. If you feel like selling is what you want to do, chase selling. If you feel like management is what you want to do, figure that out. But at what level do you want to manage? Because you have to understand as well, you typically, if you're managing, you can typically manage down. You can't manage up. If you want to be an enterprise manager, you better at least have been an enterprise seller. You're never going to be an enterprise manager if all you sold was SMB or commercial. You're just not going to have that opportunity. So you got to know at what level you want to be. And so, um, but in reality, so you got to know yourself first. And then the second thing you got to do is just set your direction and commit, um, which is, 
which is hard sometimes because a lot of people like second guessing themselves. Um, but we don't have room for that. So set that direction and commit hard to it. Don't allow yourself room to to second guess that 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 course that you're setting. Um, so, I mean, that's that's the direction I'd say. Um, I think I think there's a, a lot of people that are jumping from thing to thing. Um, figure yourself out and know kind of, hey, what are you trying to get out of life and commit super hard to a plan to get that? Because I can promise you that if you, whatever you want out of life, if you're jumping from thing to thing, you're never going to get that thing you want out of life. There's a thousand paths that can get you to that thing that you want in life. But if you never commit to one of those paths, you're basically going to be transitioning laterally until you fi finally commit to one of those paths and then you can sprint forward. Yeah. So. That's awesome, yeah. man. I, I love that. So that commitment to the path and wherever it takes you is fine, but you need to commit to it and it might not go the exact way you, you thought it would go, but you're getting closer to what you, what you want. Essentially. Yeah. yeah. That, I think that, I think that commitment, like, picking a path and committing to it. That's when people say fail forward. I really think that's what they mean is you're picking a direction because if you're going to fail, you're going to fail. But if you don't have a direction, then you, it's going to set you back. Mm -hmm. But if you have a direction, the failure is only going to amplify the direction you're going. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And that commitment, that, that's when that commitment comes in, I bet, is when there is that failure and you're like, well, yeah. this is where, like what you're talking about before, like, hey, you know, embrace the suck and have that mindset you talked about in the beginning of, you know, you, you get, get away from that, uh, what was it that you actually called it? Those limiting beliefs. Yeah. You're saying, hey, no, this is part of it. I'm learning something. I'm going to move forward. Yeah, man. I love that. That's awesome. Uh, well, listen, that there, there was a bunch of stuff that we could go on to say from the pre-call interview or pre-interview call that we had. And uh, so I'll probably have to have you back on at some point to, I think one of the things that popped up in this conversation that we didn't, I didn't notice as much when we talked before was uh, those frameworks and those processes It'd be fun to kind of dig a little deeper on those and and uh, kind yeah. of go through some of those that you use that might might help other people kind of make theirs. So, um, anyways, man, it was awesome talking to you. We'll uh, we'll hit stop record in just a second. But I, if anyone wants to connect with you, I, you know, I know you mentioned LinkedIn's the best place, right? Yep, okay. LinkedIn's the best place. All right. LinkedIn's the best place to connect with Stephen Harper here. And uh, I'll have that link in the show notes. And uh, we'll say bye for now. We're going to go ahead and stop recording. And then Steve will chat for a second. Cool. All right.